Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I am Sujay King Liu, and I'm a professor of electrical engineering and computer sciences, but more importantly, I'm dean of the College of Engineering, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the College of Engineering to the Dean's Society event for this spring. Um, this is our first Dean Society event on the campus for, since we can remember, actually, since uh, certainly before the pandemic. Now, despite the many unprecedented challenges that we've all faced together over the last few years, the college has made much progress, including launching a new baccalaureate program, the, Air, the multidisciplinary aerospace engineering program that is being highlighted today. Um, this program is part of Berkeley, it's actually Berkeley Engineering's first new undergraduate degree program uh, for since 25 years ago when we first started the bioengineering department. So it's really a major accomplishment, especially amid the pandemic, and wouldn't have been possible without all the support of our Dean's Society members who are here today. So really want to just thank you all who are here today, our alumni, our, our benefactors, um, for your support that has enabled us, the college, to support the success of our students, the well-being of our students, and also the success of our research and engineering uh, education programs through the pandemic and beyond. So why don't I just leave a round of applause to all of you supporters. We're grateful. So this fall, we welcomed our first co cohort of aerospace engineering majors, 40 stellar freshmen. And I think you've gotten a chance to meet some of them. But what's even more amazing that we have more than 300 students from across the entire campus who are involved in aerospace-related clubs or student organizations. And they're featured outside in the Garbarini Lounge today. So I hope that you've had an opportunity to meet many of these remarkable students this afternoon. You know, their enthusiasm for the future of aerospace is truly contagious. Would you agree? Yes. <laughs> We're also very proud to have alumni who have paved the way for uh, aerospace, for humanity. Today, we have with us the widow of aerospace pioneer and mechanical engineering alum, Galen Etemad, who headed a team that worked on the command module for the historic Apollo 11 flight to the moon. And two weeks ago, EECS alum Woody Hoberg began his journey on a SpaceX flight to the International Space Station, along with three other astronauts. So, you know, our aerospace engineering students have a long tradition of excellence on which to build, certainly. I'd also like to welcome the faculty and students who are joining us today from, uh, from our program and from the Air Force ROTC Corps. It's really great to have you. Now, before we proceed with the panel, I'd like to share just three updates, brief updates regarding the college. First of all, rankings. Some people still pay attention to those. Um, Berkeley has, again, uh, is ranked the top public you know, university in the, in the country, if not the world. And the College of Engineering consistently ranks within the top three uh, schools of engineering in our country, you know, neck and neck with MIT and Stanford. And, you know, those are private universities where, you know, so that's saying a lot since we are a public university with um, not as many resources to compete. So Berkeley Engineering, we do more with less, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> Now, second update is um, regarding our students. Over the last um, few years, we've actually seen a steady increase in enrollment in engineering students. Because today, the demand for engineering degrees has never been higher, just as the demand for highly skilled technology workers has never been greater. So this fall, this past fall, we welcomed our largest undergraduate class ever, more than 1,300 new freshmen and transfer students. So today we have more than one third more students than we did just a decade ago. And we have not lowered our standards for admission. Our students are some of the best that the state and the country, country has um, in terms of talent. And we're really proud that the diversity of our incoming students has also steadily increased over the years. So today, uh, about one fourth of our incoming students are first in their families to go to a four year university. About one third, or more than one third, are, are women identifying, and uh, also similar percentages of uh, students from underrepresented minorities. So, you know, the last update I would like to provide you is our plan to expand this current engineering center that you are in right now, that we are all in right now. 
You know, we need more space to educate our students. But more importantly, it's the type of space that I think can make a positive difference in the students' learning experience. At Berkeley Engineering, we really are aiming for our programs to transform our students to become engineering leaders in the future. And these leaders will go on to design and build a better future for all. So as you saw today in Hesse Hall, you know, the amount of space is important, but also the quality of space to make it feel welcome for our students is important for their learning experience. So next month, we're going to break ground just on the terrace here um, to, on a new project which will expand the space in the existing floors and add two more floors on top of this building, um, a glass and a steel frame structure that will be highlight, very transparent, highlighting you know, the vibrant activities of our engineering students. So the students here can not only continue to learn you know, from in the library, get tutoring help, advising services, psychological counseling services, but they'll have more space to learn together, collaborate, and innovate together. Um, so they'll have all the resources in one building to support their academic success and well-being. So you can find more information about this project outside in the Garber Reading Lounge. You can try on a pair of AR goggles and take a tour of the building virtually. And if you're inspired by what you've seen and heard today, uh, we hope that you will let us know because we're close to our fundraising goal for this expansion project, and we hope that you can partner with us to cross the finish line. So now it is my pleasure to introduce one of, our, one of UC Berkeley's own leaders, our Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost, Ben Hermelin. He's uh, my boss. A, a faculty member in both economics and in business, uh, Do uh, Professor Hermelin oversees everything from the deans and the faculty to administration and finance, to student affairs, to athletics, the library, and art museum, and many, many things in between. It really does take a true renaissance, renaissance man. So please join me in welcoming uh, Provost Ben Hermelin to the stage. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Sujay. I'm delighted to be here at this gathering of the Dean's Society. As Sujay mentioned, my job comes with a portfolio that is diverse as our campus activities. But my real job is to preserve and grow the core excellence of the university we all love, and to make sure that the leaders of all of these campus enterprises have the support and resources they need to be the best. That's why I'm excited to represent the Chancellor and the campus today in celebrating the launch of our aerospace engineering program. You hear, it a lot, you hear it a lot at Berkeley. Innovation is a hallmark of all we do. We've been the premier public university in the nation for decades, and we don't stay that way by resting on our laurels. We do it by meeting the moment, looking to the future, and thinking big. That is exactly what Berkeley Engineering has done in creating the new aerospace major. The vision of the dean and faculty, the remarkable talents of our first year students in the major, and the exciting research challenges that Berkeley is undertaking in aerospace are inspiring. What looked like a figurative moonshot several years ago is now a reality. The aerospace program is a perfect example of Berkeley bringing its singular talents to meet grand research challenges and educate tomorrow's leaders in a vital field. The Chancellor and I support Berkeley Engineering's vision for the future a growing aerospace program, an exciting new engineering center, and continual innovation to provide a transformative education for our students. You are our partners in this, and I'm happy for this chance to thank you in person. You help make Berkeley great. I see wonderful opportunities for a signature Berkeley experience in aerospace through this program, an experience that no other university can provide in quite the same way. Let me share three themes of opportunity that come to mind. First, Berkeley has an opportunity to define a culture of learning, teaching, and discovery that is diverse and inclusive, to empower all people, including those who have, not off, those who have too often been excluded, to make their mark on the world. From the aerospace industry to college campuses, we have an extraordinarily long way to go in this regard, but the College of Engineering pushes the world to do better in this regard, to be better. And I know its programs in aerospace engineering will exemplify this. Second, 
Many aerospace engineering programs were built in the Cold War era. Think of the advances in simulation and modeling, artificial intelligence, machine learning, bioengineering, human machine interface, clean energy, advanced composite materials, microelectronics, and the private interest in autonomous and novel vehicles that have come to be since then. Now think of Berkeley's striking excellence in all those areas and what a new interdisciplinary experience in aerospace engineering at Berkeley can do for its undergraduate students. Third, I envision that our students in this new program will benefit from a strong partnership with NASA Ames at Moffett Field in the heart of Silicon Valley. There, the University of California has formed a joint venture with private developers to build a new 36-acre hub for collaborative research. The outstanding NASA Ames researchers and facilities there will be an excellent resource for aerospace engineering students to further distinguish this program. Now, I'm delighted to introduce my colleague and friend, Panos Papadopoulos, Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Faculty Director of the Aerospace Engineering Program. He's been a force of nature in working with the Dean to launch this new major, and he will introduce our panel today. Please join me in welcoming Panos. As you can tell, this is a big day for us in aerospace engineering. It's a great, great pleasure to have uh, every one of you in attendance today to see what we're doing. This is a project that started only a few years ago, so it's sort of the first step to its fruition in 2020, and we're now in 2023, and we're, we have launched it. Stuff doesn't happen very, very quickly in big places like Berkeley, but this did happen because of a lot of help from a lot of people on campus, off campus, and this is the kind of an activity that we really hope to find many, many more partners around, along our friends. Um, I'd like to introduce the panel today. So the panel uh, consi consists of uh, three distinguished um, figures, public figures in the area of space. You know, aerospace is, uh, comprises both um, the um, flight in atmosphere, like, um, flights with your commercial planes, with um, you know, drones that go from point A to point B, and of course there is space, space flight. So we're going to concentrate today on space. Space has a lot of excitement in it for many ways, and I hope that this panel will, will actually demonstrate that. So the panel consists of um, Dr. Victoria Coleman. Uh, Dr. Coleman is uh, the chief scientist of the uh, United States Department of the Air Force. Um, also, um, Dr. Eugene Tu, who is the director of the uh, NASA Ames uh, Research Center in Silicon Valley, one of the 10 major NASA centers in, in our nation. And finally, my colleague and esteemed friend, Adam Arkin, professor of uh, bioengineering here in the College of Engineering. I should say before we get uh, going with the panel that um, all three of our panelists have deep Berkeley roots. Um, um, of course, uh, Adam is on our faculty here, but Victoria is a, is a good, strong, powerful friend of the college. She has also been uh, holding a, an important advisory position in our Citrus Center, has been a great contributor to our college. And then Eugene is a graduate of our Mechanical Engineering Department, class of 88, and I should say a fellow Cal football survivor. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. So um, I'd like to start by um, sort of a general, a general question. So there is an obvious renewed national interest in space, and it's an environment where you know, humanity is, is trying to think about how to go about exploring. And I would like to hear from all three of our panelists, what are some of the most critical present day problems that can be addressed by investing in space related research and technology. So I would like to start from Victoria. All right, I'll go first then. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you, Panos, thank you, uh, uh, Dean Liu, uh, for having me here. Um, I work for the Department of the Air Force. I support both the Air Force and the Space Force. Um, obviously, from a Space Force perspective, there is a national 
security mission that is critical for us to be able to uh, prosecute in, uh, in space. Um, space domain awareness, um, uh, capabilities like missile warning, uh, battle space awareness, these are key capabilities that we need. Um, our ability to close the kill chain, frankly, you know, as um, um, you, know, you go over 400 miles on the horizon, um, you need help. You can't see anymore. Radars <coughs> cannot see past the circumference of the Earth. So space as a domain for us is fundamental. And this is why um, the Space Force was created um, almost three years ago now. But these are perhaps um, kind of marginal capabilities, if you like, that we need. Um, I had the opportunity to participate in the Global Technology uh, for Space Convention in Singapore a couple of weeks ago, where the theme was all about climate change. If you think about the ability um, that space affords us to observe the planet, to measure the planet, to understand planetary scale change, I think it's the eye of God. Um, so I, I think that is an obvious um, kind of big problem. Then there are other main capabilities like global communications, depends on space, uh, PNT, position navigation timing, you know, how many of you use your GPS to come to campus today? I, I know I had to. <laughs> um, earth sensing, um, I think, you know, in the Space Force, you know, one of the things that we talk about is imagine um, a day without space and what our life would be like if, we, if space disappeared for a day. It would not be a pretty picture, so. Thank you. Eugene? Well, Panos, again, well, thank you for uh, welcoming me here. It's been an incredible day already, incredible afternoon, seeing all the students and the programs here, just inspiring for all of us. Uh, you left out one part of my bio, which I, I, I appreciate why you left that out. But <laughs> I, 40 years ago, if Berkeley had an aerospace engineering program, I would have stayed here rather than do my graduate studies at that junior university down south. Oh, so, <laughs> so the point being, though, that in my 40 years of, of being in this domain, um, I cannot think of a more exciting time uh, to be embarking on, on aerospace. Um, and, and I say that because the world has changed, as, as Victoria mentioned, and it's, it's a very different place now. Um, we have capabilities uh, to explore that we've never had before. We have capabilities to study the Earth uh, from the unique vantage point of space. Many people don't know that out of over 130 missions that NASA runs, about a third of them are Earth observing missions, studying our oceans, our atmosphere, our land. Um, it's, it's just an incredible time. And then, maybe more significantly, or most significantly, is the commercial space capabilities now. Commercial industry that did not exist uh, more than a couple of decades ago. And to me, that's, that's, uh, that's the renaissance that's coming. That is, uh, if I can use an analogy, um, the, the growth in the future of space exploration could be analogous to aviation over the last 100 years. Mm -hmm. If you think about aviation, it started with government funding, government research. Um, then it became a, a government attempt to create an industry by offering contracts and being a first kind of major customer. Think of the US mail service. And then now, of course, most of aviation, and the reason it's part of everyone's everyday life is because it's leveraging commercial and private sector investments. That's what we're really at the cusp of with space exploration. So it's an absolutely incredible time, I believe, uh, to be in aerospace. I think these students will have an amazing future of opportunities. Uh, much more so than I did 40 years ago uh, in, in choosing where to go and what areas of space exploration to pursue. Um, some of the biggest challenges for NASA um, are things like in-space propulsion, mm -hmm. being able to get further, faster um, entry, descent, and landing, uh, because when you get there faster or you return faster, the challenges of how you enter an atmosphere and safely land is very challenging. And then uh, maybe I uh, don't want to steal your thunder, but the bioscience is related to that. Uh, the biology and understanding the biotechnology and the biology of how to extend human presence uh, beyond low Earth orbit for long durations and to successfully and thrive in that environment is going to be some of the biggest challenges I see in space exploration. Adam. So I guess I'm the ivory tower here. Um, <laughs> I want to echo something that Victoria said. She talks about um, space being where we place the eye of God. And what this means is we can look at ourselves. We look out as well. Space for us has always been an aspirational object. 
it's where we look when, we, when we're frightened about where we are <laughs> in a lot of cases. Right. Um, for me right now, what space represents is uh, our ability to see and work towards the existential problems of our future. All the things that, this was, that, that they said, incredibly important right now. But we're facing serious changes in the availability of our resources and in, 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 our, in our climate and how our Earth is changing. And we are looking to learn how to survive in a place where you know, we're, we don't have what we had before. When you're out in space, as we look to going out in space, other than thinking of it as a colonization mission, which we may have to do and get to Mars one day, <laughs> but what it's about extending the ability of humans to live in space is living in a place where your resources are absolutely positively limited, where you can accept no risk, where you have to live together incredibly peaceably, <laughs> where you cannot create any waste. You have to use everything that you build. So if I want to explore space, if I want to maintain a presence in space, if I want to go to Mars, and I want to go to Mars, or I want my students to go to Mars, maybe I won't get there. <laughs> <laughs> I want them to do so in a way that is healthy, sustainable, risk-free, uh, and uses the resources present in a regenerable manner. So when the work that we do is kind of about how do we allow people to survive and thrive in this incredibly harsh environment. And what space research does is it changes the valuation system. Mm -hmm. If I try to make some of the technologies I want to make for Earth, they're not economic. They don't scale yet. They're not going to be invested in, in the way that they would be in space, where a single astronaut's hand motion costs a million dollars. What they're interested in is, how do we survive in that really strange environment where you're logistically cut off, where the energy is very limited, yeah. where the space is limited, and where human resources are limited. And if I can provide new technologies that allow a colony of 20 astronauts to survive for two years on Mars without logistical support and delivery from Amazon, <laughs> I can do that for Earth, too. And I think that's where the major existential changes are going to come from. Thank you very much to all three of you. So I want to press on this, on this question a little bit more, actually, because it's in so many people's minds, actually. So I, I do remember that uh, Stephen Hawking, 2017, a little bit before he died, he said that uh, humanity needs to uh, colonize another planet within 100 years or face the prospect of extinction. A few years before, he had said 1,000 years. Mm -hmm. And just before he passed, he actually said 100 years. I don't even want to think what the extrapolation <laughs> curve looks like there. But um, tomorrow. The, maybe tomorrow, yeah. So, but whether, whether it's true or not, I mean, what will it take in terms of research and technology for humans to achieve that goal? Let me start again with Adam and then go to, um, to um, um, Eugene and Victoria. What will it take? OK, this is the question, 100 years. Yeah. What do we need to do? Right. So I, I hope Stephen's wrong. <laughs> uh, my, 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 I think we have, a, we, have a, we have a duty to our own planet before we exploit someone else's. Exactly. Uh, exactly. And, and I think that, that our first job is to do that. Now, I think what Victoria said, and what support Victoria said, which is what, what um, Eugene was talking about, is we have to get a really, really good view of what is happening here. It is extraordinary what you can learn from looking from above. Mm -hmm. You can understand how water flows at multiple depths. You can understand how plants are changing. You can understand the motion of people and large populations. You can understand the mineral content of soil. You can understand how temperature is changing. You can understand how the gases are changing around us. We have to get such extreme control over that measurement that we can know how to intervene at planetary scale. That's a scary statement. But we're going to have to do it. Our water table is in trouble in the United States. Our, we're seeing huge population shifts due to changes in temperature. That's going to exacerbate a number of problems. Space is where we're able to track this. So the first thing I would say is our metrology for measuring everything from afar 
has to be made, because we can't, the spreading that many sensors mechanically is hard, <laughs> right? So we need to be able to get the sens this, this, this sensory apparatus to an extremely high precision. We need to have the data science that supports that, that allows us to predict what's going to happen from current state. And we need to develop the action plans that allow us to act on those, on those objects, which requires planetary models and all the way down to individual like, you know, <laughs> block size you know, um, operations. So it's that integration of scale from the measurement of space all the way down to the, to, er, to the er, that's what's going to ha have to happen. Now, there's a whole bunch of other things along the way. We have an energy problem. You guys know that. That means energy resource, energy storage is going to be a big deal. That's how we're going to get things where they need to be. We need to be able to regenerate resources and use our waste streams because that's what's causing a lot of our problems. And so there's technologies for doing that. Um, I think if we're going to colonize the next planet, if we really are going to go to Mars, if that's really our, our remit, um, we have a serious problem with just creating an environment that we can live without, without, without going insane. Mars is not a hospitable place. It's not going to be made hospitable in 100 years. It's just not. So we have to bring hospitality with us. And how do we create that in a way that's flyable <laughs> mm -hmm. and establishable without using the entire Earth's GDP? <laughs> so that's what I think I have to do next. Eugene? Yeah. Yeah. Well, very hard to follow, as excellently uh, said. <laughs> and and I, 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 I would not presume to interpret <laughs> what was in the mind of Professor Hawkins, but two things come to mind, mm. and one of them uh, clearly Adam already mentioned. Um, for, us to, for us to be able to even consider reaching that kind of goal, uh, it requires two things, which could have been in his mind. Right? One, of course, is the technology involved. And as, as has already been stated so eloquently, um, there's nothing that requires more sustainable technology than trying to live off this planet. Mm -hmm. And so to develop the technologies and the processes and the practices that allow us to live off this planet, whether it be in space or on another planetary surface or even on the moon, is going to require technologies and capabilities that will help us on this planet as well and help us be able to sustain ourselves on this planet and not create a situation where we can't survive more than 100 years, 1,000 years, or, or beyond that. I think the second key point there may be, maybe it will take the world's GDP, and maybe that is part of the argument too, because it is going to be an all-love endeavor. Yeah. I mean, every, if any of you have heard an astronaut talk, the first thing they say is what they notice disappears when they go into orbit, and that's borders. Yeah. There are no borders when you're looking at the Earth from space. Those are a artificial, political creation by humans. And the conflicts across borders are also a creation of ours. So if you, even if you think about today with the International Space Station, you know, we, the United States, are still collaborating in a professional way on the International Space Station with Russia. It's absolutely required. If either party were to pull out, it's done. Right? The US module controls all the power and the Russian module controls all the propulsion on the internet. So it's mutual dependency <laughs> to be successful and survive on the International Space Station. Take that endeavor now to something even broader than that, like settling another world. It's going to take everybody to be working in concert and working together to do that. And maybe that's what will save humanity beyond 100 years or more. Thank you. <laughs> Victoria. Well, so, uh, I, I had it easy with the first question because I. Uh, <laughs> so this is much harder. Um, <laughs> if I uh, just to, to pick up off uh, where Eugene left off, I, I think um, it, you know we know that research is important. Um, we know that much of that research um, actually has to happen uh, in microgravity uh, environments. So I think one of the fundamental kind of um, aspects of this conversation is what enduring sustainable R&D infrastructure we need to put in space because the ISS it's coming to uh, to the end of its life I think it's what four years five years 2030, left. 2030 is right um, commitment. what will replace it who will own it who will operate it these are all things that we need to be thinking about and I'm sure that um, you know, NASA is thinking about it much more than we do in the Space Force. Mm -hmm. I know the White House is thinking about it. That there is a, um, there's a strategy, a microgravity strategy, that is about to be released from uh, the Office of the Science and Technology uh, Policy. Um, 
we talk a little bit about money and GDP. I think the truth is that unless there are viable business models that will bring together a, um, you know, a collection of, you know, bright, incredibly, you know, um, resourceful individuals to build out the businesses, because this is not going to be, you know, a government thing. I think businesses will have to create uh, that future. Business models will have to be created. And yes, funding will need to be applied, but fundamentally, you know, businesses go where value is created. So we need to figure out what is the value creation potential for all these different kind of activities. Um, perhaps all these things are obvious. I, I, let, let me tell you a thing that to me actually was not obvious, and I heard about it in Singapore. Somebody said, and actually in Singapore, I think the government is starting a program on this, to look at the impact of being pregnant in space. What does that do to, uh, to the fetus? Does it mean that we're going to have many more preterm pregnancies, for example? Uh, would babies be born a lot smaller than they would be uh, on Mother Earth? Because, you know, for a fact, if you're going to go to a planet like, like Mars and live there, you know, it's not going to be always going to send people from here. So just think about the enormity of that for a moment. It's, it's one thing to have somebody in space have a baby. How will that baby become somebody who can invent a future? Who's going to teach it? Where's Berkeley? <laughs> right? Just th think about that. Who's, so, so, you know, society as we know it is built, you know, on layer upon layer upon layer of, you know, ingenuity and culture. And, you know, none of these things are present in outer space. So, you know, mm -hmm. my learning from that is let's focus on Mother Earth. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> let's, let, let's get this right first and, you know, uh, you know, colonize and maybe beyond our, uh, beyond our, our, our lifetime. Um, it's, um, you know, when you start considering everything that makes the human race be what it is, all of these things are questioned in that environment. And just to state the obvious, it's a very austere, very unforgiving, one would call it a denied environment. Um, and just parenthetically, you know, once in a while in my job, I, I get the opportunity to fly in the back of a, uh, you know, of a jet that is fairly fast, not as fast as. Um, even that jet, you know, an F-16, which is, you know, I, it's, it's um, the majority of our fleet in many ways in, uh, in the Air Force. I would say about 45 to 50% of all systems inside of the jet are there to support the human being. Mm -hmm. that, so, and, and that is in a forgiving environment. We fly them in 23,000 feet. Um, putting people in space uh, in that environment, expecting them to operate as a society in space, suspended in this microgravity environment, I think it's probably something that Adam needs to write another book about. Uh, <laughs> but don't you love the idea that we can be intentional about that? I mean, it's one of the few places we can begin to design society from the beginning. And, I, and, we, and, and there, it was shared purpose. I mean, I think this is one of the things yeah. that Eugene brought up. I, I agree it's a problem. And I, 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 well, I'm, ju just one problem, Adam? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a systems guy. It's a system, but it's a systems it's a problem. System. Yes, <laughs> that's true. Um, but I, I like the idea that we can think of that, that even if we don't do it immediately, that we have to think about it. And what Eugene was, I think, was implying was that even as we, even on Earth, we're beginning to do this. We have to do this. If we, we have to, to coordinate against these big problems, whether or not it's living on Mars or living on Earth in 100 years, which I'm going to tell you right now, 100 years on Earth is going to be a big change for us. A big change for us here in the Bay Area because of where we live. Um, we have to be intentional mm -hmm. about the society that we're going to create out of this and the technology we use to support that society. Yeah. You know, I, I am a Star Trek person, so I get yeah. it. You're, you're, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to continue on this line of, uh, of conversation and ask uh, a little bit about fundamental research. I mean, that's what we like mm -hmm. to do uh, in the um, American U Research University. So, could we probe a little bit the question of how can fundamental research in the U.S. university system advance the development of space-related technologies? Can we start with uh, Eugene? Sure. Um, 
I think in many ways, you're already doing that here. And other universities are, are pursuing that as well. Uh, because I think in aerospace and in space, you mentioned it at the very beginning, it's fundamentally multidisciplinary. I actually believe most of the biggest challenges we have to solve are fundamentally multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. And it's not always been the way we've educated ourselves, our people, right? uh, our children, our students. Um, we've set up domains of departments and specific domains of expertise, and we often define the fundamental research by those domains. Where I think there's a, there's a domain of fundamental research that is basically multidisciplinary, and I think that's what we're going to have to pursue. Uh, I, I agree. Okay. That's right. uh, that's <laughs> Wonderful. So, Victoria? Um, so, so, you know, I started my career as a, uh, as a professor also, and then eventually I migrated away because I was really interested in working on capabilities versus basic R&D. So my, my kind of take on this is that um, if we focus our fundamental research on creating key enabling capabilities to get us into space, to maintain us into space, to grow us into space, then we'll be in a pretty good place. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, it, it's a great way to accelerate you know, movement forward if you have you know, a grand vision, a goal to get after. Um, and I'm going to posit one of them, just to, to get everybody uh, perhaps thinking. Um, space mobility and logistics are two aspects of the same coin. Uh, when we think about space, you know, we normally think about siloed missions. You know, we put something together, we get it out there, it executes its mission, and then we move to the next one. Um, in order for us to start building this vision, in fact, in order for us to be able to execute our mission inside of the Space Force, uh, logistics, in-space logistics, are a fundamental uh, mm -hmm. capability. Um, you know, we want to be able to, um, to do responsive launch. So it doesn't take us you know, six months or a year, maybe longer, uh, to, uh, uh, to put a capability up there. We're going to be able to um, reposition assets in orbit, not put them out there and park them and then we forget about them. Uh, we're going to be able to upgrade them, and repair them perhaps. So the way that we uh, put them together through modularity, for example, through putting as much functionality in software, which we can change remotely, um, we have a big um, kind of moniker in, in the space force. We talk about maneuver without regret mm -hmm. because fuel, of course, is uh, limited. Um, every time you make a choice to move a satellite, uh, you now expend a, you know, a cent percentage of its, uh, mm -hmm. of its lifetime. I've been able to do that without regretting it, um, huge. Uh, what does fuel in space look like? You know, what, what do the Teslas Space charging stations uh, look like. Um, you know, on orbit assembly, uh, in space manufacturing, um, autonomous docking, I mean, all these things that, all, all this kind of infrastructure that would allow us to operate in space, I think, you know, it's a wealth of really interesting, juicy problems that we can use, you know, to um, perhaps to inspire. You know, the, the, both the students in, um, in the new program here, but also you know, faculty and you know, research and so on. There is certainly no shortage of good problems to work on. That's wonderful. Adam? I'm going to synthesize what you guys said for a minute. Um, some of them asked why, why I'm at Berkeley. You know, as, as, if, as if it's something, I think, well, Berkeley chose me number one. but. <laughs> You know, Berkeley is a public service university, and Sujay said we do more for less. But it, that, what, it, what it really comes down to is this, is that Berkeley has no walls within it. Um, and so multidisciplinarity is easy. Problem with what multidisciplinarity is, lack of focus. Berkeley is a big, noisy place. Mm -hmm. And you can't, it's very hard to train students to think across those disciplines without them getting dissipated against it. So here, here's a trick. The trick is mission-inspired research. Mm -hmm. And we have... In the service of our, you know, we're a public service university. In the service of our public, our ability to create sustainable food, pharmaceuticals, materials, 
fuels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, those things are things we can put into a space context and drive our students forward to create that value, both the industry and their education simultaneously. Uh, I think that um, we are uniquely poised to do that here because of the panoply of strengths we have across these disciplines mm -hmm. and because of our focus towards public service and the public good. It's what we do. So uh, I would echo what Victoria said. Let's state grand challenge missions. Mm -hmm. Let's break them down into a series of achievables and set our students on them because our students will make those things happen across those disciplines. I would love to follow that with a uh, thank you. <laughs> just, ask, um, just to ask Eugene and, uh, and Victoria to reflect, knowing the Berkeley that they know, how do they feel that Berkeley's role will, what do they feel Berkeley's role will be in the aerospace revolution? How is Berkeley uniquely situated? in order to be part of this revolution. May I ask Eugene first? Well, I'm going to be selfish about this one uh, because mm -hmm. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the partnership that NASA and NASA Ames has established with Berkeley. And to have, to have a NASA research center co-located with a major university's aerospace program, students, faculty, shared facilities, um, I think, is going to, to redefine what it means to be a research center and create opportunities and open doors for how that research can be conducted by our students under the leadership of the faculty for the future. So that's just kind of at a local level and maybe at a selfish level what I'm, what I'm really hoping that we can set forth um, with, with this new program. Um, I, when I had a chance to speak to the students, I said one thing you should never forget is you will, are the only group that will be able to say that you were the first class mm -hmm. of freshman aerospace engineering majors at UC Berkeley. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Victoria? Um, so um, this is a large school, to, uh, to Adam's point. Um, many, many things happen here. Um, there is a ton of foundational research that you know professors and um, students do up and down the campus. You know, the Suche there. I mean, her work in microelectronics is fundamental to just about everything we do. Um, cyber. You know, I mean, how can we possibly think that we can perform missions? You know, without um, resilience uh, in space. Perhaps these things are obvious, materials, you know, propulsion. You, know, you and I had the opportunity to speak about some, about some of these things not so long ago. Um, but then, you know, Berkeley is more than just fundamental research. Berkeley does a ton of engineering, especially in the school. So if you start thinking about a space architecture, what does that look like? Um, you know, in the Air Force, we are you know, actively trying to imagine what that architecture would look like so that we could execute our mission. Uh, and we will come up with something, you know, we absolutely will. Um, but I think Berkeley, uh, both um, the, because the school has the right capabilities, but also Berkeley, frankly, is a platform. Somebody needs to create a vision for what that space architecture needs to look like. And again, we will do that in the Space Force, but we will do it to prosecute our mission, not to enable all these other amazing things we were just talking about. I think it's an incredible opportunity for the school, you know, coming at the heels of the new major here, to formulate that vision, to talk about space futures. What does the you know, what does the architecture look like? How many satellites do you need? Where do you need them? What communication needs to take place? Um, you know, what integration needs to take place between the commercial side and the, um, the defense side? How do you then layer on top of that, operating that infrastructure? You know, in, in the oceans, we have shipping lanes. In space, we will have shipping lanes. Um, on, you know, on Earth, we have the uh, air traffic control system, who will, you know, I think Berkeley has just, I mean, when I think about the work that is done on this campus, there isn't anything that I just talked about, that there isn't one, two, maybe 10 professors already working on. 
I mean, pulling all that together and just leading on top of this amazing platform of this school, what a privilege that would be. Can I, can I yes, add one please, thought to that? Um, because I really appreciate what, what Victoria just said, and, and I would even expand it further. Because, of course, Berkeley is known and, and is, is uh, as, uh, as uh, Dean Liu mentioned, uh, top-notch in engineering but also in all the other disciplines. And we often focus too much on the STEM fields. We know the STEM fields are gonna be necessary for the future of space and space exploration. But really, again, I think we're at the cusp of a new era of space exploration where we're gonna need all fields. We're gonna need the social sciences, we're gonna need the humanities, we're gonna need lawyers, we're gonna need business professionals, and, and so forth, right? And that's what Berkeley can also bring to the table because it's a top university in all those areas as well. And so bringing that to, to the table is something, I mean, we, yeah. you know, in some of the fields we already talked about where there was interest in different colleges and departments here for the collaboration between NASA yeah. and, and the university here, we were actually surprised yeah. at how many other colleges and departments came to the table and said, yeah, we, we're interested as well. And I think that's, yeah. that's inspiring. Thank I think you. that's something Berkeley can bring to the table. Thank you, that's wonderful. Well, we have obviously a, a very enlightened panel, but we also have a, very enlightened audience actually and i'm sure our audience would have a lot of interesting questions to ask we have time for a few so uh, we're not going to get the nasa guy actually we'll get somebody from another place actually uh, please raise your hand there are two microphones please raise your hand uh -oh. yes please So of course, we're all just blown away by our student groups here and the work they do. 30, 40 hours a week I was chatting with some of the folks here, 130 students just in one club. Um, what's a student group that will exist 25 years from now that doesn't exist today related to space? That's a question for you. Yeah, yeah wow. Uh, it's a hard it's, 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 it's one. It's a hard one and a great question. Um, l l l l one of the things that actually is going to happen at Moffitt Field, which I think is really interesting, is that aside from NASA and Berkeley, the USGS is there, the Geological Survey, uh, and Google and Facebook. Uh, what, why is that important? Um, because right now the United States, in specific, is about to release a series of statements about how data is supposed to flow across our various resources. We're used to data revolution. We're used to that to some degree. It's going to be different than you would think. Um, what is going to happen is the accessibility of data from every aspect of our lives, public access through standardized APIs and standardized you know, you know, approaches, is going to become enormous. And our students are going to be able to get access to that through libraries, which our own faculty create, that make that data not just accessible, but analyzable quickly and presentable in human understandable format. The ability to have agency as a young person by combining the right data and driving your research in that direction or being able to speak to a field from that research is going to be entirely different. So in 30 years' time, what I see happening is two things. The first is the agency to know what to work on and to bring that data together quickly to focus one's attention is going to be enormous. The second is that automation is going to be extraordinarily different than it was before. Automated laboratories, automated vehicles, automated everything. And that's, we've been saying that since, you know what, the, the 40s? Is yes. That, is that right? You know, absolutely. So remember the, the, house, the house of the, the future? <coughs> I'm telling you, my house is the future, my, my laboratory is the future. I can do thousands of experiments per week now. It's insane, right? In 30 years, it's going to be entirely, so the ability then to operate the experiments they need to do based on that data, entirely, <laughs> our student groups are going to be doing that because they'll have the agency to do that. They do not have now. Thank you. The question came, by the way, by, uh, from uh, Professor Chris Dames, who is the chair of our mechanical engineering department and one of the staunchest supporters of the aerospace program. Uh, if I could introduce, actually, uh, Mr. Larry Kuznets. Actually, Larry, stand up if you want. He had a question. I actually waved him off. He was a friendly <laughs> banter, actually. So um, uh, Dr. Kuznets is um, a retired NASA engineer, entrepreneur, and he is kind enough to teach a freshman seminar at Berkeley this semester 
on NASA space suits, actually. So he has a question. Go ahead, Larry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, actually, the course is called From Earth to the Stars in One Giant Leap, mm. and space suits are part of it. And what you said, and you said, resonate tremendously because I've been doing these multidisciplinary courses ever since God, I was at NASA Ames. So it's a long time. I have experience with multidisciplinary courses, both in undergraduates and graduate settings. And the thing that sets them apart, far away at the top of the list, is passion. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an unbelievable driver. So just by way of example, uh, in our class, we have 18 students. They're broken up into six groups of three. Their objective is to pick a moon in the solar system and tell me why you want to go there, how you're going to go there, who's going to go, what you're going to bring, and what are all the human factors. So, so it's six packages. And there's three students in each package. And they understand that they don't live in a vacuum. They have to, each package has to communicate horizontally with the other packages to do a mission and vertically. And in so doing, they have to look for resources. So just today, just today, that's one resource. This guy from Airbus is another resource. A student club uh, on orbital mechanics is coming to teach them about games. All this stuff happens like this. And every time it happens, that passion gets squared and cubed to the fourth <laughs> power, to the fifth power. And it's the driver. And the other thing is, it's not so important about taking an exam and, and acing an exam. It's important to work in a context with these other groups and then do your part of the group so the group achieves its schedule, its budget, its technical objectives. All that stuff is what, and, and this, there aren't many, it's like you said about interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary courses. It, it really is, I've had such a fantastic experience and I've taken a lot of the other stuff, believe me. And I'll tell you, that's the other thing I want to ask. As far as the other stuff, so, so let me tell you my personal experience. So when I was doing my PhD here at Berkeley in mechanical engineering, I ran through all that stuff. NASA was paying all of my bills, right? Mm -hmm. they, were paying for, they were paying for tuition. They were paying uh, uh, a per diem. They were paying for places to me to live. I, I mean, I was at this it's ridiculous. They don't do that kind of thing now. But everything was being paid for, right? And I was on a fast track to get a PhD, and then I ran into problems, not with my qualifying exams, but with my orals, because I fell apart. I fell apart. Now, I want to tell you who was on my orals committee, because it's relevant. Chang Tian. You know the name, right? And he gave me a hard time. And he gave, he gave our class a hard time, because believe it or not, back in those days, we had to go through tear gas to get to class. That's how crazy it was back in the 70s with <laughs> Vietnam and stuff. So uh, that plus a couple of bad experiences with bu building up the orals and nervousness and everything else. One day I found myself on the sixth floor of Echeverry and if you've been up there you know there's, there's exit doors and there's balconies. And I was looking over the balcony and there was just a millisecond that I considered, Oh no! I, I got no. I can't take this. I can't take this. And fortunately, one of the other faculty, uh, one of the other uh, members, a guy by the name of Dr. Nello Pace, who's another institution, if you, Nello Pace has had an office in White Mountain Research Center. It's, it's a little white house that's next to Bolt, which you may have seen. It looks out of, kind of out of place. And he actually outfitted the first primates. He built the couches for the primates. He, put the, he did the implants for the sensors. And I was really lucky when I ended up, I switched departments. That's why this resonates so much. I switched majors, actually. I switched to bioengineering as opposed to straight ME, right? I got into bioengineering, and the other two guys in that laboratory, they were doing the monkey stuff, and they were there 11 <laughs> years. And I was doing mathematical models of humans and spacesuits, and I got out in like two years. It's like a whole other thing. Larry, but the question. The question. Here's the, here's the question. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I just had yeah. to get, the question. I will get to yes. the question. So the question comes as that amount of angst. Uh, I can easily, easily see it. We have new students coming in. They're in a new department. They're like freshmen. And what do you do? Whose responsibility is it to tell them it's going to be all right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good question, actually. It's going to be all right. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's a great segue to ask a couple of our students who yes. we've asked if they'd like to ask a question while they have this time. And I want to be respectful of our time for everybody. And if you're a student, stand up, tell us what major you are and what year in school. And let's hear from our students. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Neha. I'm a third year physics and CS major. Uh, here on behalf of New Space at Berkeley, all of us, um, we're, we're all, I think, pretty strong believers in the fact that like as students, even as like engineering majors, having some like business and non-technical knowledge is really paramount to contribute strongly in whatever team um, company you work at. So I was just wondering what you guys' thoughts are in like incorporating more business education into like engineering programs moving forward. Yeah, I, I, I could just build upon what I said earlier. I, I think it is the future, right? Because We've got the engineering challenges, we've got the technical challenges, we've got the science questions we want to answer. Um, but as was Adam mentioned earlier, if we're going to really figure out how to create uh, an environment where people can thrive in space. Um, and even if we don't go, if we can create that environment and they can thrive here on Earth, that's going to be a benefit, right? But I think it's going to require all of society in many ways. We have, we have policies and laws that we don't know yet what they should be. Right? And there are potentially resources on the moon that now commercial and others are interested in getting access to and bringing them back for market economic purposes. And, and what are going to be the laws around that? What are going to be the policies around that? Um, also, just given the a level of investments that are going to be needed, not just for the US, but for all other countries, uh, getting the public inspired about that, and making sure the public understands why it's important. Uh, so that takes communication. That takes artists. That takes you know, filmmakers. That takes all these kind of disciplines. And then, of course, you mentioned the business. And the business is a key part of that now, because it's no longer going to be mostly a government-funded activity. Uh, it's going to require business and capital, especially in, in our system, uh, to be brought to the table and and how do they what drives them? How do they make money from it? How do they get investors all that is a big part of it as well? So I, I think it's absolutely going to be the future of space exploration And I think we're going to have time for one more question But before I do that, I'm just going to add on to what you this question is I think Berkeley engineering saw very early that that combination of technical and business was so critical And it's one of the reasons that our MET management entrepreneurship and technology doubled major some of my students are here signed up for that because they saw and immediately that that was critical to where we needed to go. So we're going to do one more question. And Aerospace will join in. And that's the MET. joining MET next year. There you go. So, you know, we're constantly, constantly moving in that direction and providing that. So we're going to do one last question so we can be mindful of people's schedules. I know some people have flights and we're going to have dessert and coffee outside. We've got one more student. We'll end with a student question. And then we'll, uh, there you go, go for it. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andrew G. I'm a freshman aerospace engineer, like a lot of the people here. And I was just wondering, like, there's all this talk about going to Mars, but right now we're focused on going to the moon again, right, Artemis. How does that factor in? Like, how does that, like, there's, there's a lot of big, like, big picture things that you guys were talking about. How does the moon factor into that stuff? Go ahead. Yes, okay. of course. It's, 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 <laughs> well, again, I'm going to leverage what, what Adam said here because um, Mars is really hard. Mars is really hard. Even for robotic missions, uh, if you go back and look at the last six, five, six decades of it, about half the missions have failed. We've had a string of successes recently, but half the missions have failed worldwide to Mars. So um, part of our strategy of returning to the moon is to really learn how to live and survive and thrive on another planetary surface in partial gravity for the long periods of time you're going to need to for any Mars mission. Even a visit to Mars is likely a two-year mission. And we've only been able to go to another planetary surface, or in this case, another celestial body surface, for a couple days. And so this is really a different model. We're going to need to learn how our systems operate. We're going to need to be able to develop them. We're going to need to be able to make sure they're reliable. And our operational model is going to change, too. When you go to Mars, the time delay alone is going to change how you have to operate. 
the way we operate now on the International Space Station is not going to be possible. Mm -hmm. You cannot have an army of people on the ground, on Earth, basically real time supporting and operating the crew when you're on Mars. It's just not going to work. And so we're going to have to figure out ways to do that. We can do some of that with Earth analog, certainly, but nothing really proves a system out until you actually put it in that hostile, inhospitable environment that Victoria mentioned. And just, just, and just think about the infrastructure, right? The infrastructure, so, so, all of that. I mean, the moon offers an opportunity to build out, for example, a power grid that then you can emulate, uh, perhaps, you know, in, yep. in Mars. But um, I, I think it's um, uh, fanciful to imagine that you can succeed in the Mars mission without a very substantive kind of period of learning and building exactly. that expertise uh, on, uh, on the moon and frankly between us and the moon. Because it's, I mean, like how are you gonna get there and how are you gonna, you know, again, I talked about shipping lanes, you know, they will have to be almost like, you know, an internet around the moon that, because it's not, the infrastructure is not gonna be just physical infrastructure, it's gonna be the cyber piece too. Um, I, well, what do they say? The sky is the limit. I mean, I guess the sky is not the limit, but uh, <laughs> Mars is the limit. Wonderful. Yes. I think we're going to um, close and thank our panel. Thank you very much.